So let us start with the candidates for the United States Senate. And we'll, we'll start with uh, Jim Hannon, who is the finance director for the Santa Fe Community Housing Trust, and a CPA for Damon <coughs> and Associates. He has degrees from the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University, a, a bachelor's degree at the University of Arizona. He has uh, worked for Congressman Mo Udall, for Arizona State Senator David Bartlett, and has been the treasurer of the Santa Fe County Democratic Party. He is on the board of directors of the Santa Fe Area Home Builders Association, chair of the Rio Grande chapter of the Sierra Club, and he's been a coach in Little League and Youth Soccer. And I think we'll stop with that most important thing uh, on that entire resume. Jim. There's always been a real ambivalence, I think, in, in the United States about the United Nations. Um, we have this idea that we're a sovereign nation and we don't want anyone kind of telling us what to do. So it's really important that groups like you exist um, to promote the United Nations because now, as you know, since World War II, it's, it's been such an important, I think, uh, international organization. Um, I do have a, as uh, Mark said, I uh, attended the Georgetown uh, University School of Foreign Service. I really have a lifelong interest in international relations and foreign policy. I also worked for several years in Mexico and the Dominican Republic um, in the mining engineering field. And I think when you live in another country, sometimes that also gives you a little bit of a different perspective on other, other places and, and when you come back to the United States as well. Uh, what I'm going to do in my short time here is I have a few general comments and then the issue that I'm, I'm going to really be talking about in terms of the U.S. and the U.N. and how we need to improve is, uh, is the two issues of global warming and what I call peak oil or the depletion of fossil fuels. Uh, but before I get to that, what I wanted to talk about are fuel um, things. I put together a chart and there's a bunch of these in the back. There may be almost enough for everyone. And what this is, is this has every country in the world. There's 194 nations at this point, 192 of them which belong to the UN, the two that don't are the Vatican City and Taiwan. But what I did is I put together a spreadsheet, and maybe there's some teachers here, it might be of some use to you, with the ranking, which has every country, but it has the population, the per capita GDP, gross domestic product, which kind of tells how wealthy they are. Uh, the female life expectancy, which gives a sense of what's going on in their country in terms of health care. Uh, the literacy percentage, um, active troops, military, active military troops, and the final column is troops per million. And so all 192 are ranked. So there's, these are in the back of the table there. If anyone would like to get one, I think it might be a, uh, a little bit of uh, useful. It's really when I started to look at some of the numbers, for example, the Female life expectancy, if you're a female and you live in Andorra, your life expectancy is 87. If you live in Swaziland, it's 33. That is just a huge, huge difference. That's 54 years difference. Um, and, and active troops is quite interesting. Of course, we hear a lot about uh, North Korea. Um, but, but there's other countries that have like 40,000 troops, um, you know, per, uh, per million population, which is just a real drain. Um, and that, that's probably one of the reasons we have such a uh, North Korea, 47,000 troops per million, uh, whereas most of the developing countries are maybe three or 4,000. The United States is around four or five. But well, we have um, actually the second biggest um, military um, after China. Uh, China has 2.2 million active troops, and we have about 1.4. So this gives a sense, I think, of. of to understand the United Nations, I think you have to understand all the countries that belong to it. And this gives you a little bit of a background. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit just generally about U.S. foreign policy. Um, I've been running since uh, March, 
And, uh, every, you know, I've actually talked about the United Nations in my brochure and on my website since, uh, since I began. And let me just read it to you. Um, we need to start building our alliances with our strategic partners rather than working unilaterally. I hope that we never see another John Bolton type as our UN ambassador. If not all of you remember, John Bolton was the interim ambassador that, that Bush kind of snuck in over the, uh, at, a, at a recess appointment. He's the fellow that said, if you knocked out 10 floors of the UN, we'd be just fine, basically. He came into the UN um, as being an anti-UN person. This is not the way to operate in this world. I think, you know, just generally, when Bill, Bill Clinton, in my view, was probably one of the most popular foreign leaders in the world. We've gone from Bill Clinton, pretty much, well, you know, maybe not in the United States, but all over the world, very highly regarded, to George W. Bush, who in most polls is the most feared and disliked person on the planet. Um, we don't get that sense because we live here and our papers don't, but, but if you go to Germany, if you go to Africa, if you go to South America, our, our, both our president and our country are very, very uh, lowly regarded at this point. And it's a shame. This is only six years to turn around. Um, so that's you know kind of a, just a general. So the, this appointment of Bolton, I think, just kind of fits into this overall idea of foreign policy as ideology. Rather than the last seven years, we've not pursued a foreign policy based on our national interests. It's been an ideological, uh, you know, the, the new century and all these groups have, have a very hard ideology and that's what's uh, been driving the foreign policy. Um, you know, Kofi Annan said that the rate invasion of Iraq is an illegal action. Of course, the media we got attacked by, by the United States and, and Britain basically on that. A um, couple other issues real quickly. Nuclear weapons. Um, we still have 10,000 of them. As part of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, we are supposed to be, uh, you know, decreasing ours. We're telling everybody else, you can't have them, but we are not taking the, um, the steps we need to start decreasing. I've been working with a group in Los Alamos, former uh, Los Alamos scientists up there who are coming up with um, a lot of good ideas for how we can do this. Um, so finally, and family planning, this is another one where it's just been a disaster the last seven years. We have been, we, we cut off funds to the groups that are doing the, the hard work of population control based on ideology. Um, what I want to talk about real quickly um, is this issue of, of global climate. I, I brought a bunch of material in the back if you have time at the end. But just to, to encapsulate what's going on, um, as you know, uh, the IPPC just uh, shared the, the Nobel Peace Prize with Al Gore. And this is the international group. They have just come out with um, basically their fourth assessment. They've been around for about 10 or 15 years. I encourage all of you to, to go online and read this. Um, very interesting. In November, they're going to take the three working groups and make a synthesis. And that'll be out in November. It'll all be online, all these reports. I brought them as well. They're in the back. But here's the bullet. We are now very, the developed world realized, basically the, the corporations and the, and the policymakers realize this is coming. And we are, we are now doing adaptation and mitigation. We will figure out, we're doing seeds that will be better in the droughts, et cetera. And we are producing most of the greenhouse gases. The developing world, the third, so-called third world, whatever you want to call them, in Africa and in, in, the, in, in the equatorial belt, will be the most affected by global warming and have the least uh, resources. We saw it with, in our own country with Hurricane Katrina. The people with means, with cars, could get out. They could go to Texas. They could go up, up north of Louisiana. The poor people could not leave. This, this will be played out over the next 30, 40 years globally as, as what, what climate change really means is more drought, more floods, more heat extremes. And particularly, if you look at the, back, the map back there uh, that I brought, through the belt, through the Sahara, and through the thing, where, where drought um, means less growing seasons, shorter growing times, uh, you know, less rainfall. Um, and then finally, the other issue is this peak oil. Again, we're now looking at $100 a barrel of oil. For, for us, for middle class people, okay, now we're going to have to pay 3 or 4 or $5 a gallon. We will adjust. We will, you know, do this and that. But if you're a farmer in the third world, 
And, and you are basically dependent, if your tractor is dependent on this, again, it's a huge thing. The Uni United States needs to take the lead. We have been fighting this issue. We have been trying to stall the, the needed steps. We need to, we need to change. So thank you very much.